Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, um, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's uh, thank you so much for um, attending our course. This is the course of diabetic delamination surgery. How do I do it? Uh, my name is Ahmed Salama from the University of Arkansas in the U.S. And I would like to welcome uh, the faculty here with me on the course and starting with Dr. Megid Girgis from uh, Cairo, Egypt, and then uh, Professor Nataraja from Mumbai, India, and uh, Professor uh, Mughazi from Cairo, Egypt, and Professor Samir Baha from uh, Alexandria, Egypt. So welcome all. Thank you so much for being with us here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you. Special thanks to Professor Nataraja. It's 11.30 now in Mumbai, and he's with us, which is really fantastic. Yes. And thank you. Special thanks to Professor Nataraja. It's 11.30 now in Mumbai. I think there's some echo in the food, uh, from the Facebook page. If you can just maybe put the, the volume down, we should be good. All right, well, uh, starting now with the, this is the plan for the course today, which is, um, uh, we'll talk about preoperative considerations, uh, which will include different things, including when to use anti-VEGF, would you do combined surgery, then we'll have video presentations from our faculty, uh, different video presentations, uh, talking about standard techniques and modifications, then we'll go into some points like tamponade choice and what are they doing newly in 2020, and, uh, and we'll end up with the conclusion of the course. So my first, uh, yes, before going into the questions, we really want uh, audience involvement, so please um, do send us your questions through the Facebook page. We'll get your questions and we'll ask the faculty as we get your questions. All right, well, starting now, so, uh, discussing preoperative considerations. Uh, so my first question is about indications for surgery. So let's start with uh, Dr. Gerges, uh, Megid. Uh, what's does the vision? If a patient has traction and retinal detachment involving the macula, would the vision uh, make you change your indication for surgery? For example, if the patient has really good vision, let's say this patient has 2060 vision, would you advise surgery or you would watch? As long as the, uh, thank you, Ahmed, as long as the uh, macula is affected and already uh, uh, we have attraction like this, uh, I usually recommend the surgery regardless of visions, even uh, if the patient have uh, good visions. But I think this patient's maximum uh, visual acuity uh, may maybe have, uh, I think, no more than 0.4 maximum. Yeah, this patient had about between 2060 to 2080 vision. It was decreased, but he was managing and uh, to make things difficult, that was his only eye. So, uh, but it's clearly involving the macula. Dr. Samir, would that make you change your mind? I, I, I think this is an indication for surgery. As long as it involves the macula, we should proceed for uh, surgery. Because he's gonna get worse, it's gonna get worse. Right? Yes, yes, exactly, yes. And uh, Dr. Morezi, what's, uh, what are your thoughts? Well, I think I'm a little bit more conservative in those cases, especially the uh, uh, those with one eye, one eye yeah. patient. Like yes, that's the problem. And uh, I think it's been like this for for quite a few months or maybe years with with this traction. And uh, I really do surgery in these patients. Uh, if this uh, the, the 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 image is not that clear, but if it is, an, there is an active fibrovascular proliferation, I will probably just augment the laser and observe and sometimes augmenting the laser in those patients actually make the traction get worse yes at that at that time this would be my breaking point to do a surgery uh this is a very it looks so from the picture that it is a very adherent traction and it involves both arcades and directly the fovea so you can have uh, iatrogenic breaks easily in those patients it's not just uh, like an epimactic brain you're going to peel so decision in, in those cases, I would be a bit conservative. If it's not an active fibrovascular proliferation, I'll just observe. If there is active uh, uh, neovascularization, I would go ahead, augment the laser, and then closely follow up the patient. And those patients are very sensitive because this is their only eye, so they would come if any drop happens. 
Okay, so Dr. Nataraja, we had the surgery versus watching. What, uh, what, what, do, what would you do? So I, I agree with him that uh, being a one-eyed and second, I'm an aggressive surgeon, but at the same time, I think I will consider if the vision is good and he's able to manage, but I'll have a very close follow. The idea is in case he has a sudden drop, and I explained to him that the same risks are there whether you operate today or a week later or a month later, depending on the vision. But I suggest to him that if he loses the vision and then he operates probably, and in my experience, the Indian patient agrees or rather accepts the problem. Otherwise, in case you operate and then you have a, uh, even a transient problem of recurrent hemorrhage, the patient gets psychologically upset. Sometimes they go up to the, uh, either go into depression or in a aggressive fighting mode. So I think I like to observe, but with a, it's like a, uh, observing with a condition that uh, we'll operate on emergency that uh, the day he will lose his vision. Right. So I think we all agree this is involving the macula. It needs surgery. The problem is the issue is when to operate and also really uh, how, how to, what to discuss with the patient. So you want the patient to get you to ask you to do it rather than you volunteer doing it. But we know that that gets worse and it's best to operate early. But the problem is it's not an easy surgery. So in this patient, we did the same. We did as Morezio was saying, Dr. Morezio was saying, we added laser. Things got a, got a bit worse and the patient was more troubled and then we operated. Right. Now my uh, next question is, okay, um, Regarding the indication of surgery still, what if the vision is very poor? What if you have significant tractional uh, retinal detachment of the macula, but the vision is light perception? Would that alter your decision as well to operate versus not to operate? Uh, so question to Dr. Again, we'll go the same sequence, uh, Dr. Uh, Gerges. Uh, the minimum vision required for this uh, uh, major surgery is uh, a hand motion, for my opinion, because uh, once the vision decreases below the hand motions, this means that the patient has a massive neural damage and structural damage as well. And uh, uh, in these cases, no expected improvement uh, even after a successful anatomical reconstructions. So, uh, for my opinion, the least we can operate it upon is hand motion for these cases. Right. Dr. Samir, what do you feel? I, th I think if you have a vision for PL or something like this, uh, this means that there is a marked uh, ischemia in the macular area and uh, possibly there is uh, uh, optic nerve uh, involvement in the, in the condition. Uh, so uh, surgery in these cases will not improve the vision post office. So I uh, hesitate a lot to, to do this. I start by giving some medication, control the condition of diabetes, control of hypertension, renal, and follow the patient for some time. If there is improvement of the condition, it reaches, for example, hand movement or better, at that time, I will uh, go ahead. Right. Uh, and Dr. Morezi, do you feel the same? Well, yeah, kind of the same. In, in such a situation, I would ask for a uh, fluorescein angiography. I would like to see the uh, perfusion status of the macula. Because sometimes you have an, uh, a very uh, nicely delineated epimac. macular membrane causing gas. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Moraes, you're getting a bit interrupted, but we could hear you. Sometimes there is a nice delineated membrane. Yeah. Yeah, so, so if you have a nice delineated membrane, and co even if it's causing traction, but the traction is not definitely the cause of the drop of vision in case where you find on fluorescein angiography that there is poor perfusion of the macula. So in those cases, I won't do anything at all. I, I, he will not benefit from just going in and removing the membrane. I'm not treating the anatomy. I want a patient to feel better vision, okay? Right, and Professor Nataraja? Uh, do you have a, in case the OCT shows the foveal traction is there. Yeah, no, I, even though yeah. We don't have an OCT yeah. for this patient. We were talking in general if the, there is a significant traction, but the vision is very poor, more than you want right. for traction. Right. So if there is a traction, and I think if, even if it's more than the thing, I definitely like to attempt and explain to the patient that uh, I can only work on the anatomical success. And before, after that, if there, there's a chance to improve, I think there's a possibility. I would like actually to make a 
uh, uh, end of the surgery as a uh, like something like a burnt out retinopathy where you do a full good photocalculation and at least keep the disc and macula left like that and if the disc is not optic disc is not healthy or if the macula is ischemic i think uh, at least you have left the eye where it will not go in for further uh, natural history of the case like getting into rubiosis and neovascular glaucoma i hope so Right. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Andraj. So the message here is we really be conservative when the vision is very poor, what you tell the patient and whether or not to operate, because it might not be only the traction, uh, as usually uh, in many cases, a mixed mechanism, but the traction might not be the worst thing. OK, what about um, what about your choice of surgery? So, Megan, would you do uh, combined surgery in everyone? Let's say that take a scenario of a 30 year old patient with clear lens. Uh, diabetic with clean lens and you're doing a delamination surgery, would you remove the lens on this patient as well? No, younger patients uh, uh, like this, 30 years old, is young patients and uh, almost uh, almost the lens usually is 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 clear. Uh, and in these situations, I uh, I do just retract me and uh, uh, preserve lens uh, the lens as much as I can. But in age above 50 years old, usually I do combine FICO uh, vitrectomy because in this case, uh, usually they have a lens sclerosis and uh, usually after vitrectomy, we can uh, uh, get in, uh, uh, lens obesity very soon. So in uh, older patients like uh, 50 or old, uh, 50 years or older, I usually uh, consider FICO vitrectomy in almost all cases. Thank you, Megan. Dr. Samir, same here. Uh, yeah, as regard the young patients, I don't uh, remove the clear lens for, uh, uh, but for the old patients, I actually I don't like to remove the lens uh, as long it doesn't hinder visualization, especially in cases where it, when the condition is complicated with uh, traction retinal attachment or combined uh, combined uh, rheumatologist and traction retinal attachment. These conditions, uh, I have to use silicone or gas. So the post-operative will be so stormy and uh, due to release of a lot of uh, chemical mediators which lead to posterior cyanica and the uh, capture of the lens and all of these complications that we know. So I prefer to postpone as long as I can and make in another uh, setting. Right. Um, uh, uh, for me, it's not the age. It's uh, Dr. Sami, like uh, he just highlighted, it's uh, the clarity of the lens. If I'm able to see, then I'll go ahead without removing the lens. And I'm talking especially in diabetics. This okay. is not the case in the macular hole. It's different. But in this case, in, in the diabetic, with a lot of inflammatory mediators, with a lot of things going on inside the eye, with the laser you're going to do, maybe with the silicone oil you're going to use, I think the post-operative of just a single surgery like vitrectomy is enough and causing enough inflammation in the anterior segment than adding the inflammation caused or induced by the cataract surgery itself. So if, if the lens is clear, I can do the surgery without removing it. In a diabetic patient, I would definitely not remove it. And Professor Nataraja? Uh, so if it is a clear, uh, 30 year clear lens and uh, diabetic, I don't, I don't remove the lens. But if it is 65, I prefer to do a fake IOL and do a combined with your study. Right, thank you so much. So uh, there are benefits and risks and um, that need to be taken on consideration. Interestingly, uh, diabetic patients, even all diabetics, their cataract after vitrectomy does not progress as quickly as other non-diabetic patients. Several groups published on this and we published on this as well. And that seems to be true. But the problem is the lens may get opaque during surgery. So maybe if you're not removing the lens, maybe have A scans just in case. Uh, if, if the surgery goes longer than you expected and um, and the lens gets cloudy. Uh, okay, what about stopping anticoagulants? Can we have a quick uh, replies from the panel? Megan, do you stop anticoagulant before the surgery? Uh, usually, I prefer to stop the anticoagulants before surgery, at least three days before uh, uh, doing the vitrectomy. Uh, but in case uh, we have to continue the anticoagulants, uh, in this case, even uh, if I plan to uh, uh, not to inject the patients preoperative, I will inject uh, these patients if I have to continue with these anticoagulants to decrease the incidence of intraoperative and postoperative bleeding in, the, in those patients. Uh, uh, but uh, I usually prefer to stop these anticoagulants at least three days before surgery. Um, of course, with, uh, after discussion with primary care physicians and whomever starting it, right? Uh, Dr. Samir, what do you do? Yes, yes, the same. I have to consult his 
physician, cardiologist, if we can stop it, it will be nice five days before surgery. Uh, otherwise, if, if, if there is no other choice, I proceed for surgery with great cautious, and I'm going to do the very simple cases, like vitreous hemorrhage or so, but for traction and combined traction, I will not operate on these cases. Um, uh, Dr. Mugazi? Well, uh, it depends on which, what type of anticoagulant we're talking yeah. about. If we're talking about aspirin, I don't stop it. If we're talking about Glavix or uh, one of the newest ones of the anti-factor 10, the, uh, like the Eliquis or the uh, Zarelto, I definitely stop them. If it's uh, absolutely necessary not to stop them and the patient's condition uh, is stable, I would postpone the surgery until he can. If it's not possible, I usually ask his uh, primary care physician to shift to a short-acting uh, uh, anticoagulant that it's stopped 12 hours before the surgery and I proceed. Uh, actually, some in those patients with uh, extensive traction and, uh, uh, and the proliferation, it's, it's good to have some uh, uh, blood thinning effect in the patient because you don't want to, the blood to clot on the surface of the right. macula. Right. So, uh, definitely, I will not stop the aspirin, but the others, uh, like I said. Uh, Professor Nataraja, what do you do? Uh, so usually I get a, a physician's opinion and make sure that they sometimes ask for PTP and uh, uh, blood clotting factors. So I think I get the physician clearance and whatever the advice I do, but definitely if it is aspirin, my anesthetist says, uh, even if the physician says to stop it, he says no problem. But the other anticoagulants, I think it definitely we have to take, take uh, stop it and then uh, we do the surgery. Thank you so much. Right in, in my patients, ninety percent of the patients we cannot stop the anticoagulants. So we ask the uh, cardiologist or primary care physician. Usually we don't stop it. So usually we operate with patients anticoagulants. Uh, and there's some evidence to show that it does not affect the outcomes much. But we try to stop it as well if we can. Right. Uh, next question is anesthesia. That's a long surgery. We're talking about ma mainly long surgery, anticipated long surgery, diabetic delamination. Can we have a very quick go with maggot local versus general? Very quick. In young patients, usually I prefer general anesthesia, but in old patients, to be, uh, to avoid any any systemic complications, I usually prefer local anesthesia. And Dr. Samir, I, I use conscious uh, sedation. They give him something like, like Kitalara and all of this. And under local anesthesia, I think it is very nice. Local anesthesia. Yeah. Local anesthesia all the way. Local anesthesia all the way. And Professor Natarajan? Always uh, local anesthesia and then with some sedation, whichever right. the right. anesthesia. Right. Okay. I, I also operate with local anesthesia. In young patients, we put them to sleep. We prefer to put young patients to sleep, but otherwise, we tend to operate more local anesthesia, actually, with minimum sedation. All right now comes the very important question: anti VEGF before surgery. Again, we're talking about a case where uh, a diabetic delamination, expected extensive surgery, and if so, when? Can we go quickly through yes and when, uh, Maggot? Uh, yes, it depends on the uh, the previous history of uh, of injections for the patients or previous history of laser. If the patients previously uh, injected uh, before or uh, previously taken a laser, or uh, uh, so. I will prefer to go for surgery without any preoperative injection. But if the patient with no history of uh, uh, injection or even laser, I will go for laser and then injections before the surgery three, three days at least, and then go, go for surgery. So it depends on uh, the previous history of laser or injection. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Dr. Samir? I don't uh, use anti VEGF, uh, whatever, for two reasons. The first reason, uh, if the patient postponed for any cause, if you are injecting anti-VEGF and the patient was postponed for any cause for a medical problem or he changed his mind, at that time you will find there is aggressive traction written attachment. Second, I'm going to show a video later uh, about how to, uh, to manage the cases with a highly vascular membrane without bleeding. Right, and uh, Dr. Morezi? Uh, I do it only in cases where the patient had never had any laser before. Um, right. It doesn't matter if you had injections before, but if it didn't have any lasers before, this is when I use this uh, the anti vegf and I, I can do it just 24 hours before the surgery. Right, right. Thank you. And Professor Nataraja, what do you do? If it is a vascular problem higher, an attraction detachment like a proliferative is more, then I use uh, anti vegf uh, for the last before. 48 hours before. 
Okay. Yes. Uh, I just want to show you this slide. I'm sure you're all aware of, especially for the audience. This is a beautiful slide from Dr. Saber, uh, the late Dr. Saber uh, group, where they uh, looked at membranes, diabetic membranes after injections, and they found interestingly that the CD434, which is an indicator of uh, um, um, uh, vas vascular and angiogenesis, uh, drops down after injection. Uh, by day seven to day 10, and then you have the contractile elements increasing, represented by actin and collagen, uh, at, again, at the same point. So you want to do this before the seven to 10 days. Usually we inject around two days um, as well. Okay, uh, now uh, let's go for the video. So can we start with Dr. Maggot? Dr. Maggot, can you please uh, start and show us your usual technique for diabetic delamination. Let me uh, get your screen up here. It will be up in a second. Here you go. Yes, your screen is there. Okay. Uh, your screen. Hey, can I just interrupt you for a second? We have a question about what do you, does INR affect? Do you have an INR set value? Maybe a question to you, Maggot. When you stop the uh, anticoagulant, do you have a set INR value you operate uh, on if patients on is on warfarin, for example, yes, maximum one one point two maximum. I can I can go for surgery, one, but right. this, it is very risky. Okay, thank you, Megan. You please proceed. Okay, thank you, Ahmed. Uh, let's uh, uh, let us see uh, my uh, my usual way in eliminating diabetic membranes in this demonstrating case. This is 27 years old lady, diabetic since 17 years old, since 17 years, no previous laser or injection. Vision was hand motion or projections, and she had a lens opacifications and diagnosed as tractional detachments. And the plan was pachyvitrectomy with preoperative injection three days before, as there is no history of laser or injection, uh, uh, as I said before. Usually, in this case, I started by core vitrectomy and separate the uh, central vitreous from the peripheral vitreous, reaching the posterior haloid, which usually integrated with the uh, uh, fibrovascular membrane, trying to find the uh, surgical plane of cleavage. And once I find the sur surgical plane of cleavage, the I think this is the most important point. I go for uh, direction uh, the uh, delaminations and start usually by manually. This is my preferred technique. Usually using two instruments: one ungraving forceps to elevate the membrane, and the other and the other using a scissor. Uh, start delaminations in the correct surgical plane of cleavage, not so superficial to avoid residual membrane and uh, uh, not too deep to avoid any atrogenic retinal tears. I go for uh, the surgical plane of cleavage till the AB centers and the cutting the AB centers and any points of adhesions and remove the membrane usually with a cutter in total, as we see in this uh, case. And usually uh, the surgical plane of cleavage, uh, usually starting from the posterior haloid, and I usually prefer to do the delamination from the peripheral towards the central, uh, I mean forward delamination. And any residual membrane, I have to remove it with a cutter. And then at the end, I usually stabilize the posterior wall and remove the vitreous base and, sh and vitreous base shaving, meticulous vitreous base shaving, as I did in all cases. And also, in this case, I usually prefer to remove the ILM. In my opinion, it is mandatory for this case to remove the old tractional element and all invisible membranes that might be present in this case. Right, very nice. And at the end, I complete the laser to the oral serrator. And in this case, I did a silicon oil tamponading because the patient has a cervical vertebral problem. This is the other case. And sometimes the membrane uh, is not too large like previous case, it's too small, but in this case, the membrane is very adherent to the underlying retinal uh, surface and the dissection is markedly uh, uh, more difficult. And also I continue the section uh, forward from peripheral to the center until reaching the epicenters. And sometimes I segmented the membrane and deal with each segment separately as with the same manner, elevate the membrane with endograving forceps and dissect the membrane from the underlying detached retina. And in this case, I revised what I did using OCT to ensure that there is no traction element on the macula and no further step was needed. Right, thank you so much, Megan. 
Um, Dr. Samir, do you want us to do you want to share okay. your okay. technique? I'm going to present my uh, technique uh, using the cutter for delamination. Is inserting the cutter between the aperitoneal membrane and the retina. There are two techniques to be used with, with the cutter delamination. Is a fold back cutter delamination. At that time, the aperitoneal membrane approach requires flexible aperitoneal membrane. The cutter actually protects the retina. As we can see here in this uh, uh, clip, video clip, we can, can see this aperitoneal membrane. And I'm using, I'm moving. Uh, the, the, the opening of the cutter is uh, forward and uh, it, it, I'm using the back of the cutter so to, to protect the retina to avoid uh, development of a trigenic break. At the same time, you should, be, uh, you should have full control on the foot switch. This means that sometimes you have to just uh, make an aspiration without cutting. At other time, you have to use the cutter with aspiration in order to, 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 to induce some traction. If you are using the aspiration only, you are using this cutter as a forceps pulling on the membrane. As you can see, it is uh, moving in a nice way and the aperitoneal membrane, membrane is uh, flexible and move with me. I think this is nice. We don't know, need a bimanual technique in this, in this uh, case, as you can see. I remove the membrane completely without the use of the forceps or a scissor. There is also this is the conformal uh, this is the conformal cutter delamination. At that time, you direct the opening of the uh, of the cutter toward the membrane. At that time, you should be very cautious because at any time you may have an nitrogenic break. The best way to do that is you just push the the, the foot switch for suction and pull on the membrane and uh, then start cutting. As we can see here. Vacuum, then elevate the membrane somewhat, then start cutting so uh, to avoid any uh, heterogenic break that may occur in these cases. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, beautiful, thank you so much, Dr. Samir. So uh, we have uh, uh, okay, we have some questions here from the audience, but maybe let's uh, leave that until we have more presentations and go through them. Um, so, Dr. Mugazi, please, let me get your screen up. Okay, um, this is my, my the first video I have here. This is just using the cutter in complex cases. And it's actually, we, we all do the, use a cutter in, in different ways, but the most important point to me is to find the good cleavage plane. So, this is a case of, of, of aggressive traction. And I always elevate before I cut. And uh, that's the point of using the cutter. You always stop where you find the epicenter, like uh, this one here. And then you try to just segment at that point uh, to be safe over uh, the retina. And you don't need to use except the cutter in those cases. I, I don't use the, uh, the scissors for those cases. And uh, you can see you can safely remove those membranes, segment and delaminate at the same time using, uh, like Dr. Samir elegantly showed, the backfolding or conformal uh, delamination. It really depends on uh, the situation. So, um, of course, you have to have a good control of your cutting rate and suction, and you should not uh, uh, rush into elevating the membranes or pulling on them too tightly before testing the uh, actual, what we call the uh, flexibility of the retina uh, to see if, if, if this is doable. This is another case uh, using, again, the same technique of just using uh, the cutter to delaminate. It was associated with subhyaloid hemorrhage, but you can see the aggressive traction involving uh, the macula, involving the fovea actually also. And you can see here, uh, I'm just trying to find a good uh, cleavage plane. I can find some, uh, whether by pushing the membrane or just uh, levitating it a little bit using the cutter as well. And then once the plane, the, the cleavage plane is seen, you can, you can go safely. You can see here it's involving the fovea. Okay, and, and uh, I'm, I'm here just using a very little suction just to uh, try and disengage these membranes. And uh, it can be easily removed without uh, the use, further use of, uh, of any other instrument. Um, this is a, a, the last case for this technique here. And you can see also aggressive traction and uh, combined traction rheumatogenous case, especially on the nasal side here. 
again, finding the cleavage plane is very important. And uh, just levitating like this, just uh, trying to push uh, rather than pulling, can, can actually show you exactly uh, where to put your cutter. You can see here, here it's an easily detachable uh, membrane without causing breaks, but breaks can happen. So you have to be very careful. This is, of course, at triple speed. It's not that fast. So, uh, it's beautiful. Yeah, so once, once, once you know uh, where you're cutting, once you know the retina, where the retina is and you've separated the membrane, um, you don't really need to use except uh, the cutter. Of course, I didn't show that there are other steps like island peeling and stuff. I'm just showing this uh, technique. And this is at the end of the surgery, uh, quite a difference from the uh, beginning. So uh, this is just a technique for the uh, using the cutter. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. And that's your usual standard technique, unless yes. things are more difficult. You Am I right, as you go, surgery, uh, you, you test the membranes. You have your armamentarium of instruments. Uh, you can use other instruments, like I'm going to show later on. But in those cases, I didn't need to use anything but the cutter. Right, uh, Professor Nataraja. Yes. Um, so. so is it thing? I, I can't see it yet, but no worries, take your time. We can actually have questions until you're set up there. Yeah. So a question okay. about, uh, um, bimanual uh, technique. When do you usually use the bimanual technique? I think the question was for the three panelists, uh, Dr. Samir and Dr. Al-Baha and Dr. Mughezi. You will show us more on that, right? Yes. Uh, Doctor, yes, I got you here, Dr. Uh, Professor Nataraja. Yes, you're on. Yes, okay. Uh, you, you're able to see the screen? Yes, we are good. We can see you now. So, uh, the, I, I use the wire, the 3D now, and then and that's what uh, we are doing it. So I think that, uh, this is a 48-year-old uh, with a diminution of vision in two days. He's a diabetic since 11 years. Both eyes uh, counting finger half meter. And uh, here you're seeing the uh, lenses uh, on. And then uh, we make the 23-gauge uh, vitrectomy. And uh, uh, so we have the vitreous hemorrhage and the uh, action rectal detachment. So I clear the vitreous hemorrhage, release the anterior post uh, 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 the uh, traction. And then when there's a traction on the macula, I actually use most of the time the vitreous cutter itself to release the uh, traction. And, uh, there's a, a good PVD, but I think uh, when uh, you can see the uh, fibroblastic proliferation from the optic disc towards the uh, periphery, including the traction on the macula. So I release all the traction. Fortunately, the membrane is not that much adherent to the retina. So this particular case, uh, uh, I did a diatomy and then uh, uh, shot, cut shot the fibrous proliferation to prevent further bleeding. Did a, the patient did not have uh, any laser before. So we did a thorough pandemic on photovigilation and, and trim the uh, fibrous proliferation as, uh, as much as possible and complete the uh, the vitrectomy and also uh, to make sure that uh, whatever traction you see you are uh, and do a fluid exchange and being a fakey guy you make sure that the macula is in position and then i don't use the gas here and only thing complete the and uh, make sure the macula is uh, totally attached at the conclusion that's so, very nice thank you so much yeah. so okay Right, so, I'm sorry. Sorry, uh, so uh, questions here to the um, uh, panelists. In some cases, you may have clotted blood at the macular area during delamination and very difficult to remove. Uh, what do you do for this? Uh, or my other question really is sometimes actually either the, it's bleeding, it's all it's, it's 
is bleeding and bleeding and bleeding. What would you do for to stop bleeding? And uh, what would you do for the blood clot? So let's start with Megan. Megan, if you can have a short answer from yourself, what would you do to stop bleeding? Yes, to stop bleeding, I have first to elevate the infusion pressure, maybe up to 60 or 70 millimercury. First, uh, second, I, with, with the high infusion pressures, I just mechanical press on the bleeder points by using the NOQ2. Uh, this is quite efficient to stop bleeding even from large blood vessels. This is what I will do. And uh, Dr. Uh, Samir, I know you'll show us your technique. Anything else other than your te technique that you will show us? No, actually, I, I'm using, you have, when you have a bleeding, number one, you have to take a look on the monitor uh, beside you and to look for the blood pressure. Sometimes the blood pressure is going high and you should tell your anesthesiologist to, to minimize the blood pressure. Uh, second, you have to elevate the infusion bottle, as Maggie said. Uh, third, you have, uh, you can inject perfluorocarbon to tamponade the retina and to stop bleeding. And with the use of diathermy, you can stop the bleeding vessel. Right. Amorezi, any... Uh... Well, uh, there are two points to this question. Uh, the, the first question is how to stop the bleeding, and the other question is how to deal with the blood clot on the surface of the retina. Yes. So, stop bleeding, I will not add more to uh, what Megan and uh, Samit just said, but the, the, the point is it depends really where the bleeding is. If you have a bleeding on the disc I can, I, or the major vessels, major arcades, I think, uh, uh, like Megan mentioned, just mechanical compression, of course, likely uh, over the bleeding point with the tip of the... Of Tom can do the trick, but you have to be patient. But uh, in, in the periphery, I usually don't care much about the blood. I just keep uh, you know, uh, pushing it away with a fluid needle. But if a, a blood is still going on at the end of the surgery, I have to cauterize this. And I, I'm really cautious with the cautery because it can leave a break yeah. around, okay? And I even make sure I laser a lot around that those points of, of, of cautery. The other thing dealing with the, uh, uh, with the hemorrhage on the surface of the macula. Well, of course, all of us have noticed that if you have the ILM there and was not removed, that the blood sticks more to the surface of the macula. So at the very early beginning of the surgery, I make sure I don't leave the blood to collect on the surface of the macula because at the end, if I leave it till the end, what happens is it, it is even stronger than a membrane. So when you try to remove it, it definitely create breaks. So if, if you have early bleeding, uh, try to control it so long as you didn't remove the ILM yet. If you in the middle of the surgery and you have removed the ILM over the macula, this is a no problem. You can you can easily remove the blood later on the clot uh, over the detached or removed area of the ILM safely. Right. Thank you so much, Professor Nataraja. What do you do? Anything different? Uh, no, no. I think sometimes I use PFCL uh, I, uh, and then also increase the pressure for make sure it doesn't cross forty seconds, and then I re re reduce the pressure back to uh, twenty or twenty five. And then on, under the PFCL, I, I can use the pressure also to stop the bleeding. And then once I take precaution to prevent that's the best. Then after it happens, I, many times it's a mess when the blood clot is on the surface of the yeah. macula. That's true. Okay, uh, now I'll show some videos as well. Um, Uh, so, uh, one of the things I always think uh, of when I'm doing delamination surgery is vitreous chysis, and vitreous chysis, particularly in traction rectal attachment, is a big issue, and it's nearly in 90% of patients, as was shown before by uh, Dan Greger and colleagues. Uh, if you look at this OCT picture here, um, so there is, uh, is the picture clear? Yeah, yeah. 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 sorry, I could like I don't see the screen very well. So the, there is actually, if you look, this is the posterior pool here. And if you look outside the central area, there's this vitreous chysis here where you have a layer posteriorly, and that's most likely the layer you first see curving around the eye. And, you, and sometimes you think this is actually the posterior hyaloid. And if I open this, I'm in the correct plane. But there is another layer which is re growing along the wall of the eye and along the retina. And in this layer, usually, it's connected with the membranes where the star is here. And that goes along the disc and the optic nerve. Uh, interestingly, when you go to the, towards the posterior pole, the layers are very much near to each other. And that's why I take advantage of this and try to, I start central rather than uh, peripheral to central. 
Uh, again, on the same token here, this is a non-diabetic patient. Difficulty getting uh, the vitreous out with the cutter, although 650. But then, because sometimes this happens when you have different layers of the vitreous, the inner layers only are getting in the cutter. And if the vitreous is so adherent, you're not getting it. And this is an OCT scan through, and you can see the multiple layers of the vitreous. And one way to get this, uh, to get in that, whether diabetic or non-diabetic, is to use the pick, because you can go underneath all the layers, as shown here in this video. And then you're in action. Uh, this is my standard technique, is I start central. Uh, I, if there's no dissection plane, uh, plane, then I would use the pick to just start lifting up uh, the plane. If, there's a, if I can see an evident membrane, I just go with the forceps and pull it up a little bit. You can peel gently on the nerve. The nerve is not going to get cut. The problem is the retina outside it. But I start around the nerve to make sure I'm actually in the correct plane now. I'm not going to uh, lose my way from vitreous kysis. And then after that, I continue with the cutter and doing a combination of uh, what Dr. Uh, Samir described, cutter uh, delamination and segmentation and contact. This is actually uh, an interesting point here where in diabetics, the membranes are joined with the vitreous. You'll see here as I cut around this membrane, Now I can have access to the vitreous. Other than that, you cannot really have access to the peripheral vitreous because it's all joined together. And you see now that I can actually propagate now the hyaloid. So it's different from like macular holes uh, for the audience and the young generations hearing us. And again, a combination here and hemostasis by pressing on the cutter. And uh, once the membrane is, um, is free, it can deform and you can do cut back. And then, uh, and then in this case here, peripheral uh, laser and finish off. Uh, this is another case here where I'm actually pulling on the disc with the forceps to start the dissection plan. And then I work my way with the cutter. Uh, I usually don't routinely peel the ILM unless it's reconnected with the membranes or the macula is very uh, affected and very um, curled. So that's what I usually do. Is um, I usually work with the cutter and I start from central outside and I'm very careful about this phenomenon of vitreous kysis. So I start the dissection at um, central and work out peripheral. All right. Uh, let's go to another round of uh, videos. So maybe more complex stuff. So back to Dr. Uh, Megan. Uh, Megan, so if you have a, a regmatogenous element in the detachment, a combined traction regmatogenous detachment, would that make you change your technique? We've seen a mix of start with cutter, and then you like to go to bimanual surgery early, right? Yes. Okay, so okay, let's have, uh, what about if you have a more complex case with traction regmatogenous detachment? Okay, let us see this case. Uh, do you see my uh, my video? Yes, sir. Yes. yes. Okay. Let us see this case. This case of uh, combined traction regmatogenous treatment detachment affecting the temporal area, and is the same technique as I uh, as I, I told you before. Uh, separation central vitreous from the peripheral. Vitreous. This is the tear of the of longest standing traction, and separation of the central vitreous from the peripheral vitreous, and then reaching the posterior hyaline and try to segment the long membrane, as you see in this video, and dealing with each segment separately, elevating the membrane with one, with one hand and dissect the, uh, the membrane with the scissor for the, uh, with the other hand. Uh, this is the highlighting the uh, tear. And this is very important point. I try to dissect the membrane all around the tear because I think the unimanual dissection of membrane around the tear is very risky to enlarge the membrane and remove the membranes on the surface of the, uh, of the retina. Uh, as usual, in these cases, I remove the ILM and uh, uh, I surmise the area, the, uh, the pre-existing tear, in order to drain the subretinal fluid and the usual technique 
uh, laser and then gas branding in this case. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Megat. Right, Dr. Uh, Samir? Okay. I'm going to demonstrate the bimanual uh, dissection uh, uh, in somewhat uh, more difficult cases. One of the mo most, I'm using in this case forceps and uh, vertical uh, scissor for uh, dissection of the membrane. As we can see, there is a detachment and the retina is moving up and down. So you should uh, be very cautious uh, during uh, dissection. You should cut from the epicenter. As you can see, the epicenters in the area of the attachment of this membrane to the retina, you should go through the proper plane. Otherwise, you are going to induce an intergenic break. It's very important to have a good uh, visualization or a good light system. You should have a chandelier or you should use a twin light in order to have an excellent visualization. As you can see, I dissected the lower membranes, then I'm going to the upper one. I complete my job. Then I go for fluid exchange. As we can see, there is some heterogenic breaks uh, developed in uh, during dissection on the nasal side of the optic disc. Uh, there is another case. This is another case with forceps and curved scissor. The, 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 the best scissor for dissection is the curved scissor 135 uh, angulation. This angle is very uh, nice for to go under the retina and to cut the membranes. Also, it is an excellent uh, scissor to pass through the cannula system because if, uh, if you are using a horizontal scissor, it will not pass through the cannula system. So 135 angulation is the best for our procedure. Also, I can use the cutter as a second instrument. I'm using the forceps with my left hand and with my right dominant hand, I'm using the vitreous cutter to dissect. I can use it as a scissor to cut. And sometimes I'm using, uh, as you can see, there is an heterogenic brick here. I'm using as a blunt, uh, as a pick to dissect the uh, membranes. Beautiful. That's beautiful. So it's a very nice way that how you use the vertical scissors to yes. delaminate, yes. actually. Uh, very interesting. Yeah. But, but I like more the... You prefer the horizontal curved scissors? Yeah, the curved scissors, yes. Okay, all right. We have some questions about uh, ILMP. Let's have the second, complete the second round of uh, videos and maybe then we can answer these questions. Uh, Dr. Morezi, please. Okay, um, this is my way of doing uh, bimanual uh, surgery in uh, in diabetics is uh, using the uh, 25 gauge pick. This is a tough case, uh, combined traction, rigmatogenous detachment. I start with the cutter as usual. This is my preferred technique, trying to just find the correct planes. But in that case, I found the retina highly mobile, especially in the, that lower part of the uh, of the retina. So I, I introduced the 25 gauge illuminated uh, uh, pick and. Uh, uh, I think the advantage of this one is that you don't need actually to use a chandelier light with uh, uh, with this system. And the other thing is, uh, unlike the forceps, uh, sorry, unlike the scissors, uh, it cuts at several points at the same time. So it can cut several epicenters at the same time by just sweeping under uh, uh, several areas of strong attachments of the membranes, like you can see here. Uh, of course, it can be used. This is at the end of the surgery. Of course, can be used. Uh, the scissor can be used in the same way if you use it uh, uh, closed. This is another case, and again, you see how tough the membranes are. This, of course, has been treated with uh, intravitreal antivegetal before surgery. I couldn't open anywhere here except using this 23-gauge uh, needle uh, just to open uh, over the macula and uh, a little bit more uh, just, uh, nasal, uh, just temporal to the disc just to find a good uh, cleavage plane. And of course, you have to be sure that this area of, of the vitreous uh, of the membranes are detached. So once you open, uh, 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 you open the, your way, uh, the rest is easy, so long as the posterior hyaloid or the membranes are not attached. But you can see here, they are firmly adherent and the retina is kind of uh, mobile and detached uh, under uh, all around the macula. So again, here I used uh, this illuminated pick and you can see um, it, it's kind of safer on the underlying retina. It's sharp, but not that sharp. So uh, it can, you can sweep under good vision because of the light. 
and you can find uh, a good cleavage plane to go ahead and just uh, segment your membranes. Uh, here using the cutter itself as a forceps or as another pick, just to, to show me enough where are the uh, uh, points of attachment, of the epicenters, where I can uh, just uh, cut them uh, tangentially, safely, under a good visualization uh, using this uh, eliminated uh, pick. And of course, uh, the, the rest is easy. Once the membranes come out of the retina, uh, the rest is easy. And you can, of course, uh, switch hands and use it on the other side uh, if you need to. Uh, like in this is here is this temporal uh, area of detachment with again strong attachments and you can see uh, it's very easy to cleave your your way and it's safe on the underlying retina uh, in in those special cases that's beautiful thank you so much and uh, professor nataraja yes so i'll share the screen You can see the screen? Uh, not yet. <laughs> no? Uh, no. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. So this, this is a case where uh, a 14 year old female with history of diabetes, 20 years, they diagnosed to have a combined natural detachment and a cataract. So we planned a, a cataract surgery. Uh, and, and also, I don't do cataract, my colleagues do the take over the intraocular lens. And then uh, following that, uh, they do the vitrectomy. You can see the, I'm doing a diathermy, but I make sure that diathermy does not reach the optic region. It's already a pre existing. Uh, Retinal uh, break uh, uh, scene with attraction and then uh, to the nasal to the desk. And then and I, I have already diagnosed the fibrous proliferation and I'm dissecting the uh, the membrane from the retina using mostly the cutter. Uh, and then uh, I also uh, see some subretinal uh, hemorrhage which is there. I'm using the cutter and uh, removing it. And there's also a pre retinal hemorrhage on the surface of the retina. And uh, I think uh, uh, so. The, you can see now the subretinal hemorrhage is totally clear, but there is a bleeding from the surface of the fibrous proliferation. And I think I, I, uh, I diathermize, uh, make sure that the, whatever I cut is uh, not bleeding. And then uh, here I'm again using the cutter to remove the clotted blood from the metals uh, of the optic disc. And I'm also clearing the uh, fluid from uh, subretinal fluid. And I'm now doing diathermy around the break just to. I identify so that uh, while com after completing, I'll do a endo laser around that. And I'm also clearing the posterior vitreous uh, over the surface of the retina and the macular region. And then uh, I use the scissors to uh, uh, actually do the delamination, which I'll do after uh, I finish the uh, removing the anteroposterior traction and the tangent traction nasal to the optic disc. And uh, here I'm using the petrol brush to clean the surface of the uh, macula and then uh, in between I'm also draining the subretinal fluid to make sure that the retina is flattened and you can see that uh, I'm uh, oh, you, uh, the retina is already getting flat and then the fibrocular uh, still the fibrous traction is uh, over the retinal break so I'm again uh, after using the scissors now uh, I'm using the cutter to trim the fibrous proliferation and release the traction from the optic disc region to the uh, towards the break which is already existing and then we can some hemorrhage happening and I make sure that the the, uh, uh, the intraocular pressure on the slightly ahead side and then like when I do some more diet and me and then uh, uh, finally release all the traction and I'll be now doing an endo, uh, endo drainage and I'm using the perfusor carbon liquid Again, to make uh, avoid the uh, hydrogenic break when I'm going to dissect the uh, membrane from the break towards the optic disc. So I'm using the forceps to uh, do the uh, peel the membrane off uh, the fibrous proliferation from the break towards the optic disc region. And uh, and then uh, I think maybe a biomedical surgery would have been uh, 
better, but I think I could see and release all the traction. And under the PFC, you can see the retina is getting flattened when you are releasing the fibrosis proliferation from the disc region. And then uh, uh, under the, you can see the PFCL is uh, just uh, over near the break. And then I do the two direct exchange through the uh, retinal break existing. And I do a, a, a make sure that the still the PFCL is there and doesn't enter the subretinal space. And once you have released all the traction, most often the PFCL does not go, but still in the Till the time the entire subretinal fluid is uh, drained, I think you have to keep the uh, make sure that the fluid, the subretinal fluid, uh, the peripheral carbon liquid does not enter in the subretinal space. Sometimes you see uh, subretinal PFC at the conclusion of surgery or in the post operative period. And uh, you can see the retina is uh, almost uh, totally getting attached. And I dry the entire uh, uh, subretinal space as well as on the surface of retina and then do a laser around the retinal break and continue and confirm and do the pan retinal photocoagulation and make sure there's a good laser mark between the disc and the, uh, the retinal break and make sure that the entire retina is uh, covered with the pan retinal photocoagulation. And since the traction is totally relieved and uh, the periphery also is, uh, uh, all the traction is relieved, I decided only to uh, leave the eye with the gas. And I, and when by the time I complete the laser, I can see I'm also draining of the further uh, uh, fluid from the surface of the as well as from the uh, subretinal space. And the entire eye is uh, filled with the, uh, and then I do a C3 air uh, exchange. So about a 10 to 12% gas I inject. And I think uh, I don't even position them. And then that's the end of the surgery. Thank you so much, Dr. Nataraja. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, so a question to the uh, older panel about ILM peel. Uh, Dr. Uh, Megid, uh, do you routinely peel the ILM in diabetic patients? Uh, in all traction and retinal detachment affecting the macular area, I regularly remove the ILM. Okay. In the previous, in the video, but nowadays with the uh, with the era of IOCT, and I frequently use IOCT in almost all cases of diabetic uh, vitrectomy. I found in some cases I found no tractional element left behind after removal of the diabetic membrane. So I hold this case after ensure that the there is no tractional element on the macular area. I hold the uh, ILM being in this case. You hold off uh, from peeling it. Okay. And Dr. Samir, what do you do regarding the ILM in the TRDs? I, if, if I am sure, I, I removed all the membranes from the retina. So what is the rationale of removing ILM? The, the surgery of ILM or ILM peeling has a lot of complications like downfill and other complications. So I don't I, I do not do it as a routine. Right. And uh, Mohamed, Moezi, what do you do? Well, I, I, it's a little bit tricky to remove the ILM in diabetic patients, especially those with detached retinas. Uh, yeah. You can see the underlying retina is really friable in those cases where there is a tractional or egmatogenous element involving the macula. And you can see sometimes a large cyst in the fovea. And uh, just removing, even if you stain and well stain the ILM, if you remove this, you're risking uh, breaks in the macula and you're risking, of course, deroofing those cysts. So I only go for that if I have uh, something like a vitro macular traction causing tractional diabetic macular edema. Those cases I treat like I'm using, I'm, I'm dealing with an epimacular membrane, but I don't routinely peel the ILM in tractional or tractional hematogenous RTs. Yeah, I, I do like um, the same, the same you, as you said, uh, uh, Dr. Morezi. Uh, Professor Nataraja, what do you do with ILM? So don't routinely remove the ILM, and I actually do only when there is a macular edema with the apparatal membrane on the macula, and otherwise, almost more than 90%, I don't do ILM. Right. Okay, I'll uh, as I'll share my screen for my video. A quick question to Dr. Morezi: Where uh, what company makes the illuminated pick? Alcon. Alcon. I said I reach my Alcon. Right. Uh, this is a case of uh, bimanual delamination. I really don't like bimanual delamination much. I feel there's much traction going on, but when things are stuck or it's difficult to remove with the uh, forceps, uh, with, sorry, with the cutter, uh, then that's what I do. Um, 
uh, and here there's uh, it's just difficult to remove. I mean, notice there's still pool there, so you need to be really cautious what your uh, other hand is doing because that can create tractions and break, uh, especially in diabetic retina. And usually I would use a chandelier. That's another modification here, which I do sometimes. Again, I, I always start from the center. I don't start from peripheral out. I start from in out. Again, because of this vitreous crisis element. Here I'm just pulling a little bit. I got a little bit of posterior uh, hyaloid separation with the cutter. And now I'm just cutting through, as Dr. Samir was saying. You have to be careful that your retina is behind the edge, is like under the cutter and is, the membranes are away. Uh, and then you can peel a little bit gently, but you need to be very cautious uh, about peeling in diabetics. And I would peel as much as things are going, but uh, be very wary about epicenters. And then if things get cut, stuck, I would use the scissors. As here in the same case, I'm just pulling a little bit to expose the planes. So I tend to peel a bit on the disc. Uh, and here I'm doing visco dissection, just introducing the uh, viscoelastic, which sometimes really helps make uh, the cutter delamination quicker. And again here as well, but you need to be cautious to lift up the membranes and inject slowly. And then, um, and then the plane opens up easily, easier with the cutter. Um, so that's, uh, that's my video here. Okay, well, um, I think as we're getting more, as we're getting more questions from the audience, uh, let's see some more videos of complicated cases. Uh, Megan, you mentioned about uh, interoperative OCT helping you. Uh, can you show us any of uh, of your other cases? Yes. Please go ahead. You're on. Sorry, Megan, you're off. Let me just one second. Yes, you're on now. Uh, you you ask again your question. Uh, uh, my question about intraoperative OCT. Do you find other than looking at the end, if you can get a focus, because sometimes with traction yeah. and attachment. Trying to get a focus on the INM is difficult, uh, but if you can get a view, uh, how does uh, OCT help you uh, doing so? Yes, let us see these cases. This is diabetic traction detachment with macular hole, and these cases are different levels from severe chronic long standing traction and retinal detachments. Membrane, as we see, very adherent to the arcades, and with the use of IOCT searching for the correct plane of cleavage, I find this area is a very good area to start with the dissection. And so I started with this area because I got a, a very clear image for the uh, 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 surgical, a good surgical plane of cleavage, and I started by manually as usual is this is my own technique and remove all blood and at the end i revised what i did using ict to find no residual membrane left behind and this is only retinal folds and not a retinal membranes this is other case similar quite similar case of diabetic membranes other diabetic membranes covering the anterior the upper and lower and the optic nerve as well and so with ict searching where to start the bleeding of this hard membranes covering the arcades. And I found this area is a good area to start with the bimanual uh, dissection. And I start bleeding within a few seconds and remove all membranes and revise for any residual membrane or tissue behinds. And so no additional step or, uh, or ILM billing in this case needed after removal of this membrane. This is also a similar case of membranes covering also the arcades and the disc and also by manual removal of this membrane. And after removal of these membranes, I revised what I did using OCT to find no residual membrane left behind and no tractional elements on the macula. So no need for additional step or even ILM billing for this case. Also, this is a very interesting case. 
This is also vitreous hemorrhage with diabetic membrane covering the posterior bone and also with the IOCT to find where to start peeling. I found this area is a good area to start with this be with peeling and I removed the membrane on total and revised the central area and I found in this area in this area the middle macular hole. So I in this case I have to remove the ILM leaving a small tag of ILM at the edge of the lamellar macular hole to avoid its uh, progression mm -hmm. through fall sickness or any tractional element in this case. Uh, beautiful. Thank you so much, Megan. Very nice use of the interoperative OCT. Last one, please. Yes. <laughs> Last one. Ahmed, this yes. is a very, very short case. This is the case after removal of diabetic membranes, uh, uh, which is uh, glial membranes uh, in addition to diabetic membranes. After removal of these membranes, I found that there is a reddish spot in the area of the fovea and I asked myself, what is it? Is it a, bit, it is a macular hemorrhage or a macular hole? And IOCT answered my question very quickly. And unfortunately, it was a macular hemorrhage and not a macular hole. So no additional step was needed and no LM even ILM billing was needed in this case. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Megan, so much. Uh, Dr. Samir? Yes. <clears throat> I'm going to demonstrate the technique which uh, I innovated. I called uh, a tri-manual uh, technique. Uh, this, this technique I'm using in difficult cases where there is a tough uh, membranes uh, vascularized. Actually, it helped me a lot for these cases. As we know, in, case, in the bimanual technique, uh, there is a lot of complications uh, during surgery. The first of all, there is an out of focus because the retina is uh, detached and moving up and down. All the time, I have to change the focus of uh, my microscope. Also, there is a lot of cases of hemorrhage and atrogenic break. In my technique, I have this uh, tough uh, vascular Epiletal membrane, I told you in the beginning, we, we can, I, I'm not using anti -VGF. I start by vitrectomy and injecting PFCL. I injecting PFCL until I reach the equator uh, I, uh, to cover all the membranes until the equator of the retina. After that, I start staining of the membrane using triband loop. Usually, my technique of staining is by injecting using uh, this uh, cannula. In the inter interface between the membrane and the PFCL, so it helps to maintain uh, the color or uh, the tree band in contact, so it is seen all the time. Then, with the help of the chandelier and uh, the bimanual technique, uh, I'm using the forceps and the horizontal uh, the, 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 the scissor to cut the epicenters, as you can see. So it is a tri-manual because I'm using the forceps and the scissor and the perfluorocarbon, it is my third hand, which helps me to tamponade the retina to, uh, to, to, to prevent bleeding or minimize bleeding as much as possible. The heterogenic break is uh, minimal as much as possible, and it takes a very short time. This removal of this membrane will take just a few minutes, so it will shorten the time of the procedure. After I remove the membrane completely, I start to do uh, vitrectomy using the cutter, as you can see at the end of the procedure, the retina is attached in a very healthy condition without bleeding and without the use of uh, uh, any uh, silicone or gas in this case. A beautiful surgery. So I call this a try, try, try manual technique. I'm publishing new trials now in the retina. Nice, very nice. So when do you, um, when do you mainly uh, opt for this technique? Actually, in advanced cases, in a vascularized membrane like this, in cases of combined rheumatogenous and traction detachment, it's very helpful because uh, the perfluorocarbon flattens the retina, so I, the, the focus of the, the, the microscope is all the time fixed. I don't have to move it up and down, and everything is stable uh, under, under my vision. And the bleeding is minimal. As you can see, the, the vessels is uh, very very uh, large vessels and there is no bleeding during the procedure. And you try to get an edge of the membrane first before putting the PFCL? Yes. No, 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 no. I, I, I get the, the, the edge of the membrane after putting the IFCL and staining. So the stain give me the extent of membrane where is the end of the membrane so I can start from this point. Very nice, beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Morezi? Uh, well, I'm going to show just a continuation of the techniques that we're showing. Uh, I'm going to show uh, 
two things. First of all, the uh, use of forceps, just to delaminate using the forceps. And then I'll show you something else. So this is just, uh, this is another case, uh, uh, diabetic traction and uh, retinal detachment. And see most of the membranes here are larger fibers than fiber vascular. And uh, it's also rather flat and uh, attached all over the posterior pole. I can, uh, as if it is a case of vitro macular traction and non-diabetic. Here, again, you can use just the forceps. Of course, you have to be very cautious uh, on the underlying retina, especially those areas with lasers, old lasers, because uh, they can rip easily. And again, you test what you're doing and you pull, and you can use uh, uh, the the, uh, the forceps uh, just to, to give away to the uh, give way to the for, to the cutter to to remove the membranes at uh, uh, at the end. Uh, so forceps is also one of the uh, nice tools in those diabetic patients, and it all depends on uh, on the situation. Um, this is another case where also I I opted to use the forceps uh, to uh, facilitate the work of the uh, of the cutter. You see here also extensive membranes uh, covering the whole uh, macula here. And uh, it was not, the the cutter itself was not enough to uh, to cleave those uh, those membranes using the forceps again cautiously. Of course, you can see here I got the break uh, upper break here, but the retina was really mobile. But uh, all over, you can just uh, use cautiously the for the, the forceps, and then you can uh, use the cutter. Uh, the other thing is in retino retinectomies in uh, diabetic patients. Uh, sometimes you need to use retinectomies, like you do in rigmatogenous patients, and, and this really depends on the situation. So in this case, although the macula was not involved, but the whole nasal area was long-standing, rigmatogenous element of detachment, atrophic retina, and uh, you will see in a second here, after removing those membranes using just the cutter, that there is an area of uh, uh, clotted intraretinal blood. Uh, with surrounding fibrosis, there's no way you can remove this without retinectomy, and there's no way the retina in this area of the periphery would flatten uh, without the use of uh, retinectomy. So you can see here after retinectomy, uh, the retina is uh, settling nicely in the periphery. And uh, since I like to continue the peripheral vitrectomy under air, uh, I have a very good view of the periphery and it can relax more the peripheral retina uh, through this retinectomy. Um, it's another case. Uh, it's another case where there is uh, also, uh, you can see here, temporal uh, uh, exudation, subretinal uh, exudation, probably from long standing subretinal hemorrhage. And you can see the retina is again very friable and uh, elevated. And there is no way this retina is going to flatten without, even if you remove the whole membranes. This is, these are not amenable to dissection, not amenable to uh, just be released uh, by removing the membranes. You need to cut this retina in the periphery uh, to be able to flatten the rest of the retina. So uh, this is another example where uh, retinectomy should be used in diabetic patients just to flatten uh, the retina and uh, uh, settle the, uh, the posterior pole. Um, this, is, uh, uh, this is another case here. Uh, Last case in this connectomy thing. And again, after finishing uh, posterior pole peeling and everything, you can see here there is an area of, uh, of retinal shortening and gly intraretinal gliosis. And there is no way you can just remove those membranes and make the retina settle down. The retina is elevated. So again, limited uh, peripheral connectomy is needed in some of those cases to settle the peripheral retina and to avoid progression of the. Uh, of the retinal attachment to the uh, to the center. This is what I wanted to share here now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Morezi. So uh, I think we need, uh, maybe uh, best if we can. Uh, I I'll show a video and then we can have a discussion on peripheral traction and uh, whether to do a retinectomy or to leave alone and what are people's opinion on that. Uh, but uh, maybe Professor Nataraja first. Professor Nataraja, do you have any other videos? Yes, I'll. Uh... Yeah, we got your videos, yes. Yeah. So this is, uh, again, a 25-gauge uh, vitrectomy I'm uh, uh, doing. And 
after removing the vitreous hemorrhage, you'll be seeing, uh, I'm using the cutter to uh, actually use the proportional mold to separate the fibrovascular proliferation from the surface of retina. So I'm now clearing the uh, anterior subtraction and also trying to remove the blood using the suction from the cutter itself. So here I don't use the four substances as much, but I first now trim the uh, elevated fibrovascular proliferation and then I use the, I collect some fluid within the, uh, through the cutter and then now I'm using the proportional mode where I push the fluid between the membrane and the uh, retina so that that increases the cleavage between the fibrous proliferation and you have to do it patiently and again as much as membranes are elevated again I uh, trim it with the cutter so this, you can see that uh, they using the fibrous uh, the proportional mode I'm pushing the fluid between the fibrous tissue and the uh, retina and that's how I'm releasing all the traction and again I go to the other side of the membrane then towards the membrane side away from the retina side and then uh, remove the fibrovascular uh, proliferation and you can see that uh, I do intermittently the uh, proportional mode and then go back to cutter mode and that's how I trim the fibrovascular tissue and I remove the entire fibrovascular proliferation and now you can see the blood uh, between the membrane and the thing is uh, moved when I'm using flush it's actually flushing the fluid between the membrane and the retina and this is the other other side where there is a pre retinal hemorrhage and in case some ooze happens i under air make sure that the entire uh, hemorrhage is stopped and then complete the pan retinal photoregulation and then and i leave the eye uh, with the gas and i, I think uh, yeah i think uh, that's the uh, case and i'll probably show the Thank you so much, Dr. Nataraja. So, uh, Dr. Samir, we've got lots of questions here for you. Yes. So, uh, they're asking, uh, the audience are asking, um, uh, uh, if you get a break during the tri-manual technique, uh, would PFCL go under the retina? Yes, yes. The, the most important thing during this uh, tri-manual technique that you hold the, the, the membrane with the forceps and just elevate it. Don't try to elevate the retina because if you induce more traction, the retina will be elevated. This will allow the PFC to, to go under the retina. So be, be very cautious, just membrane, just you see the, the line of dissection and start cutting the epicenters with the scissors. This is a very important trick in the procedure. All right, thank you so much. Okay, good. Uh, I have a case here of a combined traction uh, regmatogenous detachment. Uh, it's with 3D, so I apologize for the two uh, screens. Let me share. Uh, so this is a case with uh, combined traction regmatology attachment. Here's the break, if you can see there, and it opened once I'm cutting uh, near to it. And the subretinal fluid is coming. So I'm, I'm just, uh, so I, I, I tend to use the cutter uh, as much as I can to open up and segment. And that's what I'm doing now. And so far, we have only one break, which is the pre-existing break. And again, just different uh, methods of cutter pulling and delamination. You have to be very wary, as Dr. Morez was saying, pulling even with the cutter, uh, because the retina is very friable and the membranes are so adherent. And here I'm going underneath with a cutter. I switched to the 27 cutter here. You'll see on the screen every now and again, 20,000 comes up because that's a 27 cutter, which is really very nice. And that's what I like to do now uh, because you can easier uh, get underneath the membranes uh, with this cutter, with the 27 cutter. So I would open a standalone cutter and uh, use it instead of the 25 cutter, if I find things adherent and I need a thinner cutter to go underneath. I don't particularly think that the 
uh, like the high cutting is that helpful, but I think it's the gauge of the cutter and the proximity of the um, uh, guillotine to the tip. And here, just segment again. Uh, and here, I, I got delamination, um, just to try to relax more here. And unfortunately, trying to overdo, and I end up with a break, as you can see here. So just more, uh, again, relaxation, which I'm looking at the video, and I'm not really sure even that I need to do this, because I think the membrane is segmented well enough in that area. But again, it, it got us to maybe, maybe a more perceived membrane. That's the advantage. So you can see as the dissection goes on, the retina becomes more bullous, but still managing without PFCL. And here the question, the suction carefully getting the black cloth up and then removing it with the cutter, which is a difficult situation. I feel, I'm sorry. I fill the eye with um, with perfluorocarbon liquid. I apologize. I fill the eye with perfluorocarbon liquid uh, at that stage here. Um, just enough to uh, to do laser. I thought laser might be best to do under PFCL in this case, especially if the patient was pseudophagic. We remove the cataract, and I laser around the two breaks, and then. Um, I did additional uh, peripheral laser, and then I finished uh, by putting doing PFCL air exchange and then putting gas at the end. And this patient actually did so well. And my thoughts here is because I removed all the traction as much as I can. I left some traction that I could not remove and I just segmented, but away from the brakes, uh, it's fine to put gas, which what I uh, tried to do. Uh, so now, um, I think the important question now is when when it is when when to stop the dissection. So ideally, you want to remove all the membranes of the retina, but you have peripheral membranes. Would you remove them, and maybe with the risk of making uh, peripheral breaks or going, or you will go even up to a retinectomy, or you would leave these peripheral membranes in a tractional retinal attachment. Let's start by. Can you, can, you, can you repeat this question because sorry, question there's is, an interruption? Let me actually. Sorry, let me. I do apologize. Let me get this video here. So, this is a patient where I did a very good job in the center and I clean the center. And then I have this peripheral membrane here, which you can see. Right? And my question is uh, my question is, would you. Tackle this membrane, or you should stop and leave it. So let, let's start by Dr. Samir because uh, you spoke first. Let's start by you. If this membrane is not doing any traction and no breaks around it, I prefer to leave it. I think it is doing traction. There is traction, but there are no breaks as yet. I I, I prefer to leave this membrane because okay. it would be difficult. To, to remove it completely. Would you, first, would you try it and see if it's easy to get? You will get it. And yes, I will. I will try. But if I if I found it is difficult to remove, I prefer to leave it in peace. All right. Thank you, Dr. Samir. Megan, what would you do? No, I have to. Uh, for my opinion, I have to remove all membranes, even in the far periphery of the retina, uh, whatever the cost is. Even on the cost of uh, iatrogenic tears, I have to remove all. Uh, membranes. This is the value of uh, of combined phacovitrectomy because the very peripheral membrane in presence of crystalline lens, there is a very high risk of uh, injury to the back surface of the lens. This is the value of combined phacovitrectomy even in young patients. In this case, I think of value because I have to remove all membranes, whatever the cost is. Right. Okay. Well, you can see here, Megan, I'm listening to you on the expenses of uh, multiple breaks. So let's see what uh, Dr. Moraes is going to do. Well, it depends on the situation, Ahmed. I mean, if uh, if we're talking about posterior uh, uh, proliferative membranes and mid-peripheral proliferative membranes, so I'm comfortable uh, leaving uh, the stump of those membranes 
uh, after making sure I'm detaching uh, all around them and the retina is not attached to any part. I mean, I can leave uh, multiple stumps in, in the posterior pole, so long as they are uh, uh, there is good hemostasis and there is no bleeding, and there is no direct attachment of the posterior hyaloid with those membranes. Uh, so I tried. Mourazi, let me just interrupt you for a second. So, but no, this one is, as you can see, it's a membrane continuous with the posterior hyaloid peripheral to it. It's not a segmented membrane, and we just cannot access it except from the posterior pole, but the rest is like with the vitreous crisis, all continues. So what would you This is a special case, Ahmed, because the posterior hyaloid is not the adherent here, all, all through to the periphery. So this is a very tricky situation. But what I'm saying is, if you only truncate the peripheral or the mid-peripheral vitreous from the posterior membranes, okay, and just leave those membranes at the stump and making sure they are not bleeding by cauterizing them, you don't need completely to uh, delaminate them over the retina and uh, risking uh, the, the making a break. But at the periphery, if you leave proliferation, especially, uh, I mean, of course, obviously, in case of contraction of hematogenous detachment, if you have a proliferation of the periphery, this will, will prevent the retina from settling down. But if you don't and you have a flat retina, but you have a peripheral proliferation, this can be a source of re-bleeding later on, whether you're going to use gas or leave the patient uh, fluid fill, or even if you put silicon, remove it later on, these will always be a risk for reproliferation at the periphery. So uh, I, I would remove as much as I can uh, uh, easily and safely. But in cases where I find the retina is shortened, standing like homogenous elements, or intraretinal fibrosis, or intraretinal bleeding, like I've, so, I've, I've, I've shown, I would go, I will not hesitate to do a retinectomy and remove it. This is in the periphery. Okay, so uh, you've, you've shown us the cases. What about this membrane? Would you remove it or leave it? I, I would leave that one. I you remove that. I just truncate all around it, making sure yeah, that it's not difficult to truncate except like the core vitreous, but the hyaloid is still continuous with the membrane. Unless you remove the membrane, you're not going to be removing the peripheral hyaloid. Circumcising around the membrane. Circumcising. Yeah. Okay. Professor Nataraja, what, what, what are you going to do? Uh, so, usually I like to avoid hydrogenic retinal breaks. And I think uh, I will do a patient dissection as much as possible to remove the membrane. I, I think uh, you have definitely, I think this is what I learned in the course, because if you make an hydrogenic break like in ROP surgery, in ROP it's the end of the case. Fortunately, in diabetic it's not. But I think still, because it's easy to do a retinectomy, but in case uh, if you have not removed the hyaloid and the membrane and you've done a retinectomy, I think you're into problem with the PVR, with the more problems. So I think we have to remove the membrane and the hyaloid. And then after the hydrogenic break happens, probably use a oil and demarcate with the laser. I probably, the, I may do well. Right. So I think this is why this course is so good, Rian, and why diabetic vitrectomy is very difficult. Uh, difficult in opinions. And, and sometimes actually you want to stop, but it's hard to stop. And when you decide to stop, you already have a break. Right. And uh, I think the the message that was always uh, uh, given to me from when I was a trainee, when I was a fellow is avoid a break. But unfortunately, when you have a break, you cannot stop. You have to relieve everything around it. Uh, so uh, what I do really is I, 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 you know, I've done few of these cases and this case did fantastic with gas, but I had cases that did poor even with oil. And I try to avoid membranes that are not causing a problem with the center pool. I would just leave them. I would try them. If they are stuck, I would leave them. The difficult bit is when to stop. So we have different opinions, which is really fantastic. Uh, OK, well, lots of questions here. And uh, we have one question from Dr. Ahmed Hosni. Uh, what's your usual vacuum setting for cutter delamination for 23 gauge? Um, I use 25 gauge, so uh, Dr. Negad and Dr. Baha, do you use 23 gauge? Yes. What's, what's your usual setting for the vacuum? So quick question, what's the vacuum setting? The vacuum setting in uh, case of delaminations, I usually prefer 100 to 200 only, not more than 200. Right. And Dr. Baha, what do you do? For, for my setting is a 23 for delamination for the infusion. I'm using 25 millimeters mercury for the vacuum. I'm using around 400 for the cutting rate around the 5,000 to 7,000 cuts per minute. And Mugazi, what do you do? Do you use 25 or 23? 
I mainly 23, but uh, in, in, in diabetics now I'm using 25, but 25 I use uh, 650 uh, vacuum. In 23, I use 450, and it doesn't matter if it's diabetic or not diabetic. Even if I'm peeling the uh, membranes using the cutter, it's it's all controllable via the foot switch. So I, I can change, I can increase the cutting gradient, increase the vacuum, or the other way around. So it, the preset for me is 450 for the 23 and 650 for the 25. Yes, I use the same as well for 25. I max up to 650 and 27, I use the same, and it's all linearly controlled. And I think the messagery in diabetic patients, you want to be very cautious about uh, put, pulling on the retina, whether by suction or mechanically by anastomosis. Professor Nataraja, do you have different settings? Uh, no, I think the same as all of you. So mostly I use 25 now, and whenever I use 23 also, I generally reduce the suction to about 250 to 300. But uh, with the 25, I use uh, uh, 550 to 600. Right, okay. So uh, I think that comes really the, the important question here is which tamponade you use, gas or oil? So uh, let's say we don't have any breaks, so I think it's optional then whether you put air just to keep the eye from hypotony or to leave the eye fluid filled, uh, or if you want to use something else, I think mostly like we would agree that there is no need for that. But let's say we ended up with breaks uh, in the, with diabetic vitrectomy. So what uh, are we gonna use, gas or oil? Megid? Uh, I just, uh, uh, once I removed all membranes and I satisfied by settling down the retina back to its original site, uh, whatever, uh, one, two breaks, it, it, it doesn't make sense. I usually uh, prefer a gas except in case of complicated uh, uh, with uh, uh, multiple tears, uh, uh, peripheral uh, membranes, uh, a lot of manipulations, I, uh, in this case, I prefer silicone. But the uh, defaults in diabetics generally is the case. Right, thank you. And Dr. Samir, what do you do? You know, it is a very difficult question, Ahmed. <laughs> you decide sometimes, you, you decide to put gas in the beginning of the surgery, at the end of the surgery, it ends in a different scenario, so yeah. change your mind. But in general, if the, the retina is attached, uh, so I don't inject anything, but if you have a, a single break, you are I'm going to use the gas. But if you have a multiple breaks in different quadrants, and the condition of retina shows severe ischemia, I'm afraid of... Uh, uh, deterioration of the condition. I'm going to use silicone, and I'm using 1,000 centistoke. I never use 5,000. And also, it depends on the other eye, the condition of the other eye. If there is a surgery done before in the other eye, I should look what happens in the other eye to to to, to know what I'm going to do to do in this eye. Right. Thank you so much, Morazi. Um, what do you do? Again, it depends on the situation, but for all tractional igmatogenous uh, diabetic detachments, I use silicone oil. It, uh, it's a no-brainer for me. I cannot risk it with gas, especially with our patients here. You know how complicated they are. Uh, but uh, air versus uh, uh, gas, let's put it that way. So I don't find an advantage of using uh, SF6, for instance, uh, versus just air. Even if you have some uh, some, some breaks left at the end, uh, you do good laser, you remove uh, all the membranes. And the, the beauty of, of diabetic vitrectomy is if you remove all membranes, your reproliferation is really air. It's not like PVR. So I think air is sufficient if, if uh, um, whether if I have a break at the, uh, yeah, it can be supported by air. Uh, the other thing is uh, if you have just a patient who doesn't have breaks, uh, let's say uh, just a simple straightforward vitreous hemorrhage, but this patient never had laser before. I'm, I'm quite uh, uh, relieved to leave those patients uh, uh, on air, okay? Because I, f I feel that in the very few days of using the laser, there is a lot of inflammation going on. And uh, if, if you leave the patients on fluid in those cases, uh, uh, I'm, I, I, I see a lot of fibrinous reaction, and I'm not sure... Uh, um, I cannot see the retina well, so I leave those patients on air. So the idea is whether it's silicon oil or air for me, it's not uh, SF6 in those patients. Right, thank you. Uh, Professor Nataraja, what do you do? Yeah. So actually, um, if I have uh, no atrogenic break and I use gas, and uh, many times I use C3FA, but if I have an atrogenic break and make sure 
that all the membranes are removed and there's no hemorrhage, then I use silicon oil because uh, I, I was trained by Raja Jovanovic, the second part, and then he always mentioned use and abuse of silicon oil. And Klaus Eckhart, we have I've observed closely with him, and he says even hemorrhage happening under the oil, it is an emergency. You should go in and and uh, see why the hemorrhage is happening, and you cannot leave it like that. And silicon oil will not prevent hemorrhage or uh, will not do a magic. So I think you have to do a good dissection, good removal of vitreous, and then only use the oil. And oil is not a an answer for uh, and uh, uh, not done uh, not a good vitrectomy done. So I think we should do a thorough vitrectomy, then make sure all the traction is released, then use the oil. Right. Thank you so much. So I, I tend not to use oil in diabetics, except in cases where there are multiple breaks and I could not remove the traction. And in these cases, in my brain, uh, unfortunately, I'm writing these eyes off. So it's oil for life. Otherwise, any other situation where I have uh, one break or multiple breaks, as long as the traction around these breaks are relieved, then I would use gas. Uh, I try to avoid silicon oil at all costs in diabetics because of... Uh, retro oil proliferation, um, and I try to use gas. And uh, as well, if there is no breaks, I may use air to just avoid hypotony. Right. Uh, let me just show you, this is a breakup here from uh, uh, a study that was done using national data in the UK looking at diabetic delamination surgery. Uh, it's a recent study, 2016, not very old. So it's actually, uh, there are useful things we can take from the study. Uh, one of the uh, things we can take from the study here uh, is that um, when delamination was done, the tamponade, just to give you a, a taste of or an idea about what's happening in the UK and uh, West Europe, uh, and well applies to US with tamponade. So 15% was air, 30% SF6, uh, and similar number of C2F6, C3F8, which are long acting as, and 15% of silicon oil. Uh, the rate of uh, uh, diabetic uh, vitrectomy uh, related tears in uh, in delamination surgery is about 30%. So there's a high risk that you get breaks. Retinal detachment, uh, uh, re uh, rheumatogenous detachment after tractional detachment was low in the study, was only 2.3%. And repeat vitrectomy rate was high, about 15%, which really what we see in clinical practice. Uh, and patients, about 60% of patients can gain two Snellen lines uh, gain. Um, so question to the uh, faculty, do you see these like risks, like the numbers in, in the study about retinal tears and the visual gain? Do you think this applies to your practice in terms of what we see after surgery? Do you agree like two 60%, two thinner lines gain and maybe 30% of the heterogenic tears? Uh, Megid, what do you think? Yes, more or less, yes. Yeah, and Dr. Samir? Uh, actually, the, the, this paper was published in the Royal College and the situation here differed completely from there because uh, they're, 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 they are, uh, there is a meticulous follow-up of the condition, meticulous follow-up of the condition of the retina and PRP is done at the proper time. Actually, in our, in our area, the case usually comes very, very late. They come after in a very advanced high risk of proliferative with traction and with hemorrhage, they never come in the early stages. So the, the percent in our area is completely different from this uh, study. So you think retinal iatrogenic breaks would be higher because of... I think because the cases... More complex uh, cases. We, we, yeah, complex cases. We don't have the cases of uh, just mild vitreous hemorrhage or... But to be honest, I mean, there's a delamination and a delamination, right? There are different yeah. complexes. Yes. Yeah. So these are only the cases that have a track to be with delamination. Yeah. Uh, but in our case, they usually come late. Difficult. Um, Mughezi, what do you feel? Well, I, I think the numbers are okay for, for, for my case. Mm -hmm. What you see, right. And uh, Professor Naraja? Uh, I think the visual gain is fine, but maybe the Retinal tears in my hand may be lesser than. All right, that's very good. That's, uh, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think for my cases, this is really applies well. Uh, I think in my hands, uh, retinal tears is around 30%. Uh, 
um, around that time, and I tend to use more gas as well. Um, okay, well, that takes us to the uh, next point, is what's uh, new in 2020 other than the COVID and sitting at home and doing lots of uh, webinars, which is really nice. Um, so what's new in 2020? Is there anything, any new tool you're doing or any, any new tool you're using uh, for vitrectomy? Let's start with uh, uh, Professor Megild. Yes, uh, in 2020, uh, I usually now uh, use a regular uh, IOS, uh, IOCT in regular, in almost all cases. And I usually depends on what happened after the elimination of the membranes. And previously, I removed ILM in all cases of diabetic retinopsy, even vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, I previously removed ILM, but nowadays with the IOCT, I uh, usually uh, 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 revise what I did, uh, especially in the macular area. If we if we haven't any membranes or any tractional elements, no need for any additional steps. So it uh, it uh, it gives me another uh, thought. So uh, I think uh, uh, in this year uh, uh, I use IOST in almost all diabetic uh, vitrectomy. Right, and Megan, are there any uh, tricks? Because sometimes when the retina is so elevated, you read that don't get a signal with the interoperative OCT. Do you have any tricks for that, or you just? Yes, yes, sure. Uh, in these cases, in, in in highly elevated retina, I just uh, when I'm using uh, BFO bubbles, I flatten the retina, I, and I can see well the structures uh, uh, become uh, highlighted well. Okay, and Dr. Samir, what's uh, new in uh, 2020? In 2020, actually, I'm using uh, the chandelier more and more, and I'm using uh, my techniques, the trimanual technique, in a large number of cases. Actually, it shortened the time of surgery and uh, gave me an excellent presence. Nice, very nice. Um, Rezi, what are you doing? Well, maybe uh, not that new, but uh, 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 experimenting with the uh, 27 gauge cutter. With uh, the high speed cutter? The 27 gauge. Yes. yes. High speed cutting. I think uh, this is the next best tool for uh, co complex diabetic traction and, or rheumatologic detachment. And you can easy, easily and safely uh, use the cutter at very high speeds and dissect the membranes safely. So, this is what I'm experimenting with at the moment. Nice. Very nice. And um, Professor Nataraja, what's new? We've yeah. seen you using yeah. 3D. I'm using the 3D. And uh, in the do not in the COVID, but I think emergency surgery we are doing. But uh, in the in the 2020, I'm using uh, 3D a lot, and then uh, more of uh, chandelier so that I can use less illumination and have good videos and also do by manual whenever required. Very nice, very nice. And, and for me, uh, in 2020, I similar to Morezi, I like the 27 cutter so much. I don't think the high speed is like very advantageous in my thoughts, but there's the small gauge and the bevel tip that you can get really into the planes nicer. I also use uh, the 3D, which is very nice for teaching and also for uh, learning from the videos. And I try interoperative OCT. The main, uh, main indication is if I'm not sure if the macula has a hole or not. Uh, so uh, especially in just diabetic membranes to look at whether you need to move further or not. All right, fantastic. Let's let's get a few more questions before we conclude. So we have several questions. So we have uh, people who wants to see your technique again, Dr. Samir. But the mm -hmm. the videos are the, the course is recorded. So if you don't mind the, your technique, okay. I have another I have another case for my technique. Yes, if you like to, to please, show it, please. please. Okay, let's do that if you wanna set okay. up. Okay. As, as I said, I start by injection of uh, perfluorocarbon. It already injected and start. To uh, stick, as you can see, the, the blue color of the tree band is present here. And with the help of this uh, scissor, uh, just cut the epicenters. As I said before, I prefer the curve with the scissor 135 curve. It is very nice tool uh, for dissection. As you can see, the, the, epi, the, 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 the epicenter is well seen. As I said before, or there is a lot of questions about the PF, uh, PFC, which may pass uh, under the retina, as I said, just pull on the membrane. Don't try to pull on the retina. Just elevate the membrane 
as we as I can as you can see, and just cut the epicenters and go in the area of the section. As we can see, the bleeding is very minimal because this uh, uh, perfluorocarbon tamponade the retina and prevent bleeding. And uh, as we can see, the, the 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 dissection is very nice going without development of any breaks uh, at all. And just you go till the, you, you reach the periphery and you finish your membrane, and you can remove the rest of the membrane with the vitreous uh, cutter. Uh, actually, the the, the perfluorocarbon give an excellent visualization without any turbidity in the media. At this at this point, I finish my surgery and just remove the. Uh, membrane with the vitreous scatter and the retina is perfectly attached, no break, minimal hemorrhage. Just I have to remove this uh, perfluorocarbon and uh, uh, inject uh, gas, or you can uh, just air. As uh, very nice, beautiful. Thank you so much for showing the second video. Thank That's you. beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank so you. we have we have other questions. Um, so if you have a disc stung to vessels, would you peel that off or would you leave it at the end? Usually, sometimes I peel it off or sometimes I would make a little bit of diathermy and leave it, depending on how I feel that uh, bleeding is going to be. Uh, what do you do, uh, uh, Megid? Do you peel that stump of the nerve or do you leave it? I usually uh, leave any stump uh, present on the disc. And if I uh, remove the stump uh, over the optic nerve and I have uh, a hemorrhage, a simple trick, I inject a viscoelastic over the head of the optic nerve and stay for some, and elevating also the infusion pressure. Uh, by the heaviness of the viscoelastic and the high infusion pressure, it usually stop or even clot. The viscoelastic helps the blood uh, oozing from the optic nerve to be clotted so it is easily removed after a while or after clotting and it never bleed again. If it bleed again, I repeat the same maneuver, inject viscoelastic over the head of optic nerve and elevate the infusion pressure. And on, on most of cases, the bleeding will stop. Sure, so you, you tend to leave it more, right? I you remove it. You remove it, sorry, I do apologize. Yes. You remove it, okay. And Dr. Samir, do you repeat it off or you leave it? Actually, actually, in the early days, since a very long time, I usually remove, but right uh, since a long time, I never remove it because uh, if you see the, the, the pathology, the, there is usually there is a vessel going from the disc through this stump. If you remove this stump, there will be a bleeding and the control of this bleeding will be very, very difficult. So I never remove it. I just dissect it and leave the stump. And sometimes I have to cauterize the, the tip of this stump and leave it in peace. That's very good. And Morezi, what do you do, Dr. Morezi? Mostly, I mostly leave it, okay? Uh, except only if it has a nasal or temporal attachment where I'm forced to remove it to remove distraction. Yes. But if it's only isolated over the disc, I do like Dr. Samit just mentioned, I cauterize the stump. I, I, of course, I leave it a little bit cold, not to cauterize over the disc directly and just leave it. Okay, and uh, Professor Nataraja? I think the same, cauterize and leave the stump, make sure uh, you don't uh, reach the optic disc region so that you avoid uh, post-operative bleeding. Right, I tend to leave it as well unless it's connected with membranes and, I, and it will help me start the dissection because I start from the center outside, otherwise I would leave it. Uh, PFCL can decrease the bleeding or putting the pressure up or viscoelastic, as Dr. Maggot said. Uh, so questions here from Dr. Beha Abdallah uh, to Dr. Samir. Uh, when exact timing of PFCL injection after doing vitrectomy to separate posterior from peripheral vitreous? I mean, I think the question is, if you're doing your triplanar, trimanual technique, would you put the PFCL even before removing the peripheral vitreous? No, 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 I, 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 I inject the peripheral carbon after doing complete vitrectomy. This is important. But it's still, I mean, it, you mainly I think you're talking about the core because the membrane is still connected yes. with the peripheral. Yes. I'm, like, I'm, I'm talking about the core vitrectomy. About the core vitrectomy. Not talking about, yeah, not about and then the as membrane comes, the membrane comes, the hyaloid comes yeah. off, right? Yeah. Okay. That's, yeah, exactly. uh, that's very good. And then uh, questions about brakes, laser, and 360 uh, under PFCL or air. So if, let's say, there are brakes, would you do your laser 
uh, retinopexy and tamponade under air or under PFCL? What's your usual technique, uh, Dr. Megan? Again, the question, please, Ahmed. And the question is, you have breaks now, so it's a combined traction regmatogenous, or you have lots of hydrogenic tears, and you need to laser. So are you going to laser under air or under PFCM? Uh, I usually do, uh, or like, laser under air. Under air. Even with posterior breaks, you would do, go under air as well? No, posterior breaks, usually I stabilize the posterior bull with the BFO, so I, it's very easy to do laser under BFO in central area. But briefly, I usually like to do laser, uh, even if there is tear briefly, I usually to do laser under air. Okay, and Dr. Samir, air or PFCL? Actually, to do laser, you, the, the retina should be in contact with the retinal pigment epithelium. So if there is no uh, detachment and the retina is attached to the retinal pigment epithelium, you, are do it, you can do it under fluid or yeah. you can do it under gas, under PSL. The most important is the contact between the retina and RP. So if the, no, I think the question is mainly if there is detachment. Would you sort that detachment out under PSL? You can do it under gas or CFL. It doesn't differ, but when you are doing under gas, under gas or under air, it's very important to know that the the power of the laser should be minimized because there is no the cool no cooling effect of the fluid or the PFCL. So you have to minimize the power of the laser. Right, and Dr. Morezi, what do you do, air or PFCL? Usually air. I prefer air. It gives a wider field of view. And uh, it's clearer for me than PFCL. So if I if I uh, ever gonna use PFCL to flatten the retina, I just do an air PFCL exchange and then do my laser then. Right. And Professor Nataraja, what do you do? I, I like to do under a PFCL if I'm using PFCL so that uh, the retina is flat and I do the complete the laser. And after that, I do the fluid air exchange and see whether more laser required. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I like air, but uh, um, I think you just need to be wary if the lens, uh, if, the, if there's already cataract done and if you open the capsule, uh, you can get fogging under air. So delicate things you may not be able to see well. So that's something that may make me use PFCL, especially if there are breaks posteriorly. Peripheral breaks you can very nicely, easy see, and the retina is 100% flat under air. But posterior breaks can be a bit tricky. So posterior breaks... Uh, especially if the eye is through the fake and the capsule is open, I may use PFCL. It's best to try to avoid PFCL if you can. If, if you can. Right, uh, we have questions. Uh, yeah, I, I still have unusual cases with the IOCT. Do you like to... Uh, yeah, I, no, I think that's fine if you want to put that up, yes. Okay. Ahmed, okay? Uh, yes, please. Yes, let me just get you here. I have, I have uh, three short cases, unusual cases. This is the, um, you, you see the, uh, my, my screen, your, my screen? Yes, we can see you, Megan. Okay? Yes, we can see you. Yes. This is a, a, a vitreous, this is a case of vitreous hemorrhage and vitreal membranes, and after removing the membrane, as usual, and I said before, I uh, found that there is hemorrhagic mass, two hemorrhagic mass, far periphery of the retina, and uh, by the help of IOCT, I found these two masses are originating from the choroid. So I decided at the time to take some biopsy of this mass, and I inject a uh, fluid in this mass, uh, with using of 38 gauge needle and uh, with the cutter I take some tissue with the fluid inside these two masses and send to histopathological analysis and fortunately I found that this mass is likely angiomatous lesions and no, uh, not neoplastic lesions. This is other, this is other case of also with assemblage and diabetic membranes covering the posterior bulls and after removal of the, uh, uh, the hemorrhage and the membrane as I described before, I meticulously removed the membranes along the arcades and I revised as I do usually uh, what I did using OCT and found any uh, this susceptible area that uh, uh, it was, uh, uh, I, I don't know it is as iatrogenic or the whole present. This is with the use of macular contact lens. I found this is a partial sickness uh, tear in the uh, uh, periphery of the arcade. So I lasered this area uh, with a light laser and I don't, I revised this recording video several times to find why, why, why this tear 
uh, will become uh, evidence with OCD. I don't, I, I don't uh, understand. Uh, I didn't understand. Is it hydrogenic or is behind the? So this is the value of IOCT to detect the uh, hydrogenic tear, uh, tear, which not always clinically. And this is the last case. This is a very interesting case. This is around 50 years old. Uh, Around 50 years old patients previously failed the vitrectomy in other countries with silicon oil, and uh, he referred to me, and he was siliconized. The patient was counting finger, and the patient, as we see, did uh, uh, the tenectomy in the previous surgery, and I removed the membrane, which I think this is a mixed membrane between BVR and diabetic membranes. I nicely removed the uh, membranes uh, in the uh, posterior bowl and revised. Uh, the uh, what I did using OCT after removal of the BVR around uh, the area of retinectomy and I found surprisingly that the patients had the macular hole uh, and the ILM wasn't present, maybe removed from the previous surgeon and I removed the area B uh, free graft of the ILM toward the macular hole to block the uh, mm -hmm. macular hole at the end. This is the other value of OCT to detect any undetectable clinically uh, lesions present intraoperative. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. Thank you. Uh, I, yes, so uh, that's very useful. Um, right, so uh, I think we're coming to the very end, and thank you so much for all your, for your input. Uh, so, final word of wisdom, especially for young surgeons. So, uh, I think you're focusing mainly on the intraoperative OCT, right? Uh, I'm uh, Before yes, that, there, no, there's a question which is repeating on post uh, post vitrectomy recurrent hemorrhage what do you yes do? yes i've seen that i was going to do it uh, yes i'm sorry i missed that yes what what how you do recurrent hemorrhage please professor nataraja go for it i uh, know you i think earlier i was doing that opd afg technique i take the patient to ot use the push pull technique of using a 30 gauge with a 20 cc syringe and push air and remove the uh, uh, fluid because it's a vitrectomy dry but now we're using anti vegf and doing excellent laser with a good visualization. I think um, I have hardly seen a recurrent hemorrhage as a problem because I think we can identify during the surgery and if there's a bleeding, you reduce the intraocular pressure and see whether it's going to bleed. And then if it's going to bleed, you probably uh, make sure that uh, all the diathermy is done well. And then the uh, well. And some eyes I also inject at the conclusion of uh, surgery and anti Thank you so much. Prevention is better than having, but I have not seen for long now uh, to a recurrent hemorrhage following a vitrectomy for diabetic. Maybe okay. there's a little when you use gas, but it usually goes off. Right. So nothing needs. Yeah, there's I high risk know. usually of uh, just mild bleedings, but sometimes you can have big bleedings. Uh, doctor, uh, anyone else does anything different for recurrent vitreous hemorrhages other than repeat vitrectomy if the bleeding persists? Megan, do you do anything different than uh... Uh, as long as long as I did a, a, a good job in my vitrectomy, I removed all membranes, removed any uh, cauterized any bleeder points, uh, and leave the eye clean. Uh, I I'm just satisfied with uh, watchable observation uh, for at least three months, uh, three weeks. Sorry, for at least three weeks, and then if uh, if the hemorrhage persists, I just airflow exchange. Maybe so you, in you take it in, in operating room. Uh, maybe in the office, maybe in the clinic. In the clinic, okay, all right. And uh, does anyone else do air fluid exchange in the in the clinic? No, <laughs> no. I do every procedure in the in the in the, theater. In the operating room. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, I sometimes do air fluid exchange in the clinic, not very often, but sometimes you have a patient who had five or six vitrectomies, and it becomes just a social embarrassment, really. So you yeah. try to say, well, let's try something in the clinic. In, your, in my mind, I'm trying to get him not to count this as a surgery. So instead of now down seven surgery, we did six. That's the only indication where I use it. We published on that in diabetics. It's useful, especially if there's no re significant traction left behind. Uh, but that's where I only use it. Okay, there's a question about anti-VEGF, and we talked about that. Two to three days, mostly, uh, I think, that what we agreed on. Okay, final word of wisdom then from everyone, especially for young surgeons. Megid? Uh, my advice for new generations and young uh, retinal specialists to 
uh, don't underestimate the case. We, we, we may have a simple case of vitreous hemorrhage, and after removal of vitreous hemorrhage, we can find a very tough and uh, posterior hyaline, and the removal even of simple procedures may end up into a major tear in the retina. So uh, in diabetic case, don't underestimate the case. Right, Dr. Samir. Uh, okay, I, uh, the best way to learn uh, vitreoctomy in the proper way is to start step by step. What I mean is you have to start with the very simple, simple cases until you control everything and start to upgrade yourself until you go to the most difficult case. But don't rush and go to the difficult case from the start. It will be very depressive. Right, and uh, uh, Morezi, Dr. Morezi. Well, uh, always evaluate your case well. I mean, uh, don't just look at an OCT or a fundus picture and uh, say, well, I'm, I'm going to jump in and remove membranes. You have to evaluate the visual acuity of the patient. You have to consider the patient's situation with regards to the other eye. You have to consider if this patient had any previous laser or not before uh, diving into the vitrectomy for those people. Because, uh, like Maggie said, some cases they appear very simple, okay? And you say, I'll get away with it, and the patient will be happy. But actually, when you go into the eye, uh, you can create atrogenic breaks, uh, you can damage the macula, and uh, so forth. So my my advice is just be prudent and uh, be conservative as much as you can with those patients before deciding to jump into surgery. And Professor Nataraja? Uh, so the, I, my suggestion is I recommend uh, to all my fellows that if they should read the last chapter of the uh, Vitreous Microsurgery book by Steve Charles, which says, surgical self-education and i said even at this stage after 36 years doing several thousand surgeries every case i think you have to assess if we, can you manage it pre-operatively not during the surgery so you thoroughly may decide what all the instruments required and whether you are competent enough and also analyze your own result and see whether you can manage the case in case you can't probably you should send it to your own mentor or your uh, colleagues who can manage it uh, I think we should not have any ego here that I will do every case. And I think uh, even at this stage, my the second generation retina surgeons are almost half my age. And I think uh, with good experience. So sometimes I ask their opinion and they ask me, no, sir, you're ultimate. I said, no, I think I want to know what can I do for this patient. And sometimes I say, maybe you can do this if you think uh, you can do better than me. So I think uh, the young surgeons have to know their limitation, which even the senior most surgeon will have. So I think we have to know that, and I think I know I'm appearing more spiritual than uh, what is happening with the uh, younger generation. But I think uh, most important is assessing the patient and make sure that uh, you are thorough with the patient in every angle. And you also should know whether you can. It's like the war. They, you, the pre-op, it's like playing a soccer. You actually have plan your game, but on the table, the opponent is the retina and the bleeding. It will be different, and you have to know how to do it. I think there are logarithms given by Steve Charles and many others, but still, I think you should have your own thinking. And then, and most of them, I see the, num the surgeon who's doing for a longer time is actually thinking a lot. And the surgeon who's uh, mentally ready probably does it faster. There's no question of moving the instrument fast. And I think they're thinking fast, and that reflects in your surgery and then the post op results. Tissue care, right. I think that's yes. the most important. Yes, thank you so much, Professor Nataraj. My final re word, my final uh, uh, message uh, is that I, I now regard diabetic delamination as ROP surgery. So my main aim is to clear the macula and the posterior nerve to the arcade, and that's fine. The rest, in my opinion, is bonus. So I would try, if it's difficult, I would just leave alone. Uh, and I find this is better in my hands. So this is like my strategy. No membranes, no tears, excellent. I'm a fantastic surgeon. Uh, some membranes, no tears, that's still very good. Uh, no membranes and few tears, maybe it's a second good and I would use gas tamponade, but I really don't want to go to the fourth situation where I cut into membranes and then I cannot relieve the traction and then everything becomes unsatisfactory. These patients is usually silicon oil for life uh, in my practice and I try to avoid that situation. I think of ROP surgery and I try to do that now in diabetics as much as I can. Right. Uh, I would yeah, like I to thank you all. To, uh, Please. I, I don't know. This year so happened, April 2020 seems to be the 50th year of uh, 
which is surgery started by yes. robert mackmer yes so yeah. i think you remember robert mackmer and uh, you now my other mentors of jonovich and my uh, my original mentors of badinapur i think all of them are retired and we don't have mackmer with us so i think this is the 50th year after the first vitrectomy done i think first was for amyloidosis and later for uh, diabetic yes. vitrectomy and i yes. we have learned a lot and still learning Yes, I think that's the best message to conclude the course with. Thank you so much. I especially I appreciate all of you and especially uh, Professor Nataraja. It's late now in India and he's staying with us. So thank you very much. Kudos for Professor Nataraja. And thank you so much uh, Professor uh, Megha Gurgis and Professor uh, Samir Baha and Professor Mughezi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Take care and thank you so much for our audience. Take care. And please continue to send us your questions on the Facebook page and we will try to all interact and answer them. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.